When thinking of Pluto, most people recall the massive controversy that surrounded its demotion from planet to dwarf planet around 2006. Some might think of a certain cartoon yellow dog or a Greek god. If the latter is the case, you probably know of Charon, at least for its namesake, the Ferryman of the River Styx. That's right, we're talking about the largest moon of Pluto. I'm Eric Malachite, author of Echoes of Olympus Mons, and this is Science Get. Charon has the distinction in our solar system of being the only moon that isn't dwarfed by its planet. With Pluto and Charon, the moon is actually more than half the size of its parent. At 603.6 kilometers in radius, compared to Pluto's 1,151 kilometers. Let's put it this way, if our moon were that large, there probably wouldn't be life on this planet, let alone a stable orbit. Volume and other figures make the relationship between the two more confusing, but I think that it tells us that the scientific community had good reason to stop calling Pluto a planet. However, Charon and Pluto share another interesting link that can be observed by simply watching their orbits over the course of a week. They actually orbit a point in space between the two of them, meaning the same hemispheres are always facing one another. It might be more accurate to say that the other four satellites of Pluto are actually orbiting these binary dwarf planets. Before its discovery, Charon was calculated as a part of Pluto's mass because our telescopes at the time were incredibly inaccurate, only noticing a funny wobble or bulge on the records. It wasn't until 1978 that James Christie pointed out the irregularity, and suggested that the cause might be that Pluto actually had a comparatively large moon orbiting it. This discovery didn't go uncontested either. For some time, there was disagreement about Charon's existence. Thankfully, seven years later, a cosmic alignment would allow the astronomers observing Pluto and Charon to see the two enter a five-year period of mutual transit and eclipse. This eclipse only happens every 248 years, meaning if we hadn't been paying attention, it could have taken another 30 years for us to discover Charon when New Horizons did its flyby in 2015. For all the noise people made back in 06 when Pluto was deemed a dwarf planet, you'd think we'd known about it for centuries, right? Wrong. In actuality, Pluto was only discovered 48 years before Charon. It isn't as if they were known by the ancients, like Jupiter and Europa are classified on the NASA website. Both were discovered in 1610 by Galileo Galilei. As a side note, he got into a lot of trouble over his discoveries, too. You're also liable to think that the nomenclature for all of this and the most talked about planet in 06 had been thought up by an academic hunched over peering into a telescope. The tradition to dub every satellite of Pluto after a figure associated with the underworld actually came from an 11-year-old English girl named Venetia Bernay. Venetia suggested the name Pluto to her grandfather, who forwarded the suggestion. Eventually, it made its way to Clyde Tombaugh. Tombaugh liked the idea since it started with the initials of the man who suggested Planet X existed in the first place. Mystery solved, right? No. Planet X remains a mystery somehow. Pluto was originally thought to be the mysterious Planet X. However, the search for Planet X continues to this day thanks to mathematical models suggesting that a large object must be orbiting somewhere far from the Sun with an elongated orbit. So far, Planet 10 or Planet X, whatever you want to call it, remains only hypothetical at the moment, and astronomers continue to hunt for it beyond the Kuiper Belt. After the discovery of Charon, Pluto's status as a planet was already on a timer. After all, it mathematically lost a third of its mass. Astronomers agree at the moment on its classification as a dwarf planet, but I wouldn't consider this a demotion or reduction in classification. It's simply a statement of fact. Pluto is a small planet with a system of satellites that behave in unique and interesting ways that we still don't fully understand. We have a name for the central point between two or more bodies in an orbital relationship, a barycenter. The concept actually comes into play with every orbital path in astronomy. Pluto and Charon simply have one of the most noticeable barycenters. The general assumption on gravity is that smaller objects orbit larger objects, but this isn't necessarily correct since mass isn't about the apparent size. Something incredibly small can be incredibly massive. That said, Charon is less than an eighth of the mass of Pluto for being half its size. Charon compared to Pluto is light when considering density. We don't yet fully understand the rules of attraction between celestial bodies. 
This is both exciting and terrifying. We wouldn't be able to expose this conundrum without having dropped Pluto's status as a planet. What's more, the very center of Pluto and Charon make the two appear to orbit one another. This orbital wobble puts Charon at the center of the system of satellites we currently say orbit Pluto. How these two interact is beginning to make sense to astronomers. How they got that way is probably even harder to work out. It's been suggested as a popular explanation that some impact broke off Charon from Pluto billions of years ago, much like the giant impact hypothesis, a popular explanation for how our own moon formed. Only time will tell. We'll need more information from observation to know with any degree of scientific accuracy how or why. The other images taken by New Horizons spark more questions, hypotheses, and theories as well. We saw evidence in these photos of a cold but active planet. Where before we had presumed a dead and inert world, there was evidence of frigid, bubbling cryovolcanism. Cryovolcanism is exactly what it sounds like, a very cold volcano, or flows of frigid, slushy-like material. The mysteries deepen and Pluto's status as a planet is the least mysterious and most important. It's pure speculation. But it's possible, given the cryovolcanic activity on Pluto, that Charon may be the culminated mass of ejected material from Pluto, and that it has never escaped the parent planet's gravity. If cryolava flows and volcanism behaves like geothermal volcanic activity, then perhaps a massive eruption launched material into space and coalesced to form Charon. This could account for the lower density Charon has. However they formed, we'll need to engineer better instruments through which to observe the Pluto system in order to see how cryovolcanism behaves on other planets. So while Pluto's reclassification from a planet to a dwarf planet may feel like a demotion to many people, it actually represents a step forward for science. You could think of it more like a promotion. They made an entirely new category just for Pluto. It was the first of its kind. But even though there will be discoveries that locate older dwarf planets, Pluto is the reason. In time, we can come to understand the intricacies of how dwarf planets interact with their satellites. As it is, staring at the orbital gifts of Pluto and Charon, I'm fascinated. It's actually beautiful to watch them waltz at the edge of our solar system. Personally, along with the scientific community at large, we should focus more on the new data coming from Pluto, rather than its classification. We should be fascinated rather than frustrated. Science is inherently about uncovering the truth. What happened in the case of Pluto was just that. Moving forward, revising our knowledge and understanding of the universe. Sometimes that requires redefinition and sometimes we have to take a step back. In doing so, we've taken a look at the modern history of Pluto to see that in the big picture. In the cosmological sense, Pluto's 76 years classified as a planet is akin to the blink of an eye. Pluto has existed longer than we've had a name or term for it, and focusing on the name ignores the progress that it represents. There are a plethora of mysteries surrounding these waltzing dwarf planets. Science continues to teach and uncover these secrets. In Pluto's case, we have to keep in mind that things are not always as they appear at a distance. The Pluto system is used to change, though, dancing with Charon at the edge of our solar system. It's moving the most, even though its orbit around the sun takes the longest. Things change, and most of the time they are more complex than we originally thought. If you like this video, make sure you leave a like, and be sure to let me know what you think of Pluto's dwarf planet status in the comments. And be sure to smash that subscribe button and ring that bell to be notified when new Science Get episodes come out. I'm Eric Malachite, and I'll see you next time.